To have a good harvest, one must plant good seeds and must also use the right kind of fertilizer. The carrots have grown large and firm. How good they will taste. Welcome back to the Backyard Gardens Podcast, gardeners. You're, it's a good day. Well, it's kind of a good day. It's just starting to get a little chilly in some people's areas. But Tavia's already <laughs> got a whole blanket on and whatnot, I think. What you rocking over there? This is my back backup blanket. We were just talking about the subscription episode. Remember how I was like, oh, my attitude is so much better. Yeah. Yeah. And that was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I was texting with my uh, one of one of my uh, text message uh, circles. There are three of us, and uh, one's in Georgia, and the other two of us are in Illinois. And you want to talk about what my girlfriend said? My spirit really belongs in Florida. So anyway, I told them I was just I just had an attitude yesterday, like you know. And it took me until yesterday evening to realize that I was just basically cold all day long. <laughs> like, uh, I'm glad we weren't hanging out if you had an attitude yet. all day. Hmm? I said, I'm glad we weren't hanging out if you had an attitude all day. Yeah. I, was just, I couldn't put my finger on it, but yeah. As, as my wife puts it, you were assy. Mm. <laughs> <That's what laughs> I've never heard of that. <laughs> I had but either. yeah, I definitely was. <laughs> she says it all the time. I got to give her credit. Luckily, I think you were like... You were like the only person I talked to yesterday. I must have got you before you got there. Yeah. Yeah, it was like three o'clock. It was like when I started to, you know, turn. (laughs) Yeah, that was about when we were done. So, yeah, I mean, and based on that, you know, we were recording our subscriber episodes. So if you'd like to do that, hit us up on Spotify or Apple subscriptions and you can be a subscriber and help support the show and get an extra episode a month. And we were talking about... um, what were we talking about? October gardening tasks. So basically what we did is we talked about what I'm doing in my garden in zone 8A and what Batavia is doing in her garden in 6A. And so we figured it kind of covers the line. But if you guys want to check that out, go for it. But we're here today to address Angie's question that came up in the previous episode um, this is really good. So she wants to know about a winter garden prep and plan. She wants to know how to overwinter beds, if you should treat in any way for common issues now before the next season. For example, she has late blight and powdery mildew. When to pull things out, what plants can be sown and overwintered, and maybe that topic touching on different regions. How to give yourself grace at the end of the, each season, which tugs on Batavia's heartstrings mm-hmm. and come mm-hmm. back excited. And she's in uh this she's actually has your issue. She's on the line of six A and six B. Mm-hmm. So it's it's gonna be cold. It's gonna be freezing. Um, you know, I s- assume she's probably gonna get snow. Um winter is coming. Okay. Yeah. She might not get snow. You never know. But I'm gonna oh. assume so. I'm gonna assume. So, um, yeah, there's a lot there to unpack. <clears throat> and we wanted to talk about this because overwintering your beds, especially if you're not growing, is really important. But also the part where she was saying treating for common issues before the next season, I think that's a really good concept because this all really ties in together, don't you think? Wait, yeah, I I do think a lot of this ties in together. When you said overwintering your beds, if you're not growing, are you talking about winterizing your beds? Yeah, yeah, winterizing, yeah, okay. you know, mm-hmm. putting your gardens to sleep for the winter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, we got to give them a nice blanket, everybody. Come on. <laughs> if Batavia's over here in October, early October, rocking a towel, or not a towel, a blanket, then we know we got to cover our garden beds. So, um, I, um, I feel much better. I feel like my body temperature has regulated now. I feel yeah. pretty good. Just one blanket. That's all I needed. That, there you go. Soon it'll be three or four. But um, <laughs> I think we should break this down one step at a time and just start from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, so she wants to know how to overwinter beds. But actually, we shouldn't start from the beginning. But And wants to know when to pull plants out of the garden. Now, that is an important well, it's actually an electrifying topic because some people okay. 
want to leave the plants in the garden for the different pollinators and stuff like that for protection and habitat and whatnot. But um, I think there's other parts, and this is my view, and you can tell me yours, Batavia, please. But I think there's better places in your yard that you can do that that's not in a vegetable garden. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, Last year was one of the first years I intentionally um, left. Basically, I chopped and dropped my flower bed, my front yard, street side flower bed. So a lot of what I grow out there grows on new wood every year, you know, so I could cut it back now or I could cut it back in this, you know, late winter, early spring. And so I went ahead and cut things down and I basically almost everything I just dropped where it where it was mm-hmm. um, and no harm, no foul this year. Everything was just fine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's an opportunity, you know, um, I prefer not to do that kind of thing with my garden my vegetable garden right yeah i mean because uh you know angie has late blight and powdery mildew and i mean the best thing to do for that is get it out of there because those spores will overwinter cut it out as joey would say Mm -hmm. um that they'll overwinter and just come back next year and this is where you know and we're going to get into all of this stuff in the coming weeks, but crop rotation really comes in to fight that really. I mean, that's your, in my opinion, and I think it's the overall opinion is like, that is one thing you can do that will help eliminate or slow down the spread of these diseases from year to year, which is why I grow in raised beds. Yeah, I I say uh, even with Tomato Gate 2022, I'd say that crop rotation absolutely doesn't hurt, right? Um, I for the first time grew tomato, first time ever. You know, going back to 2008's garden. Well, that's probably not exactly true. I'd say about 12 years of gardening in those raised beds and on the um, far end of the backyard. Mm-hmm. And when I say far end, it's almost comical if you see my backyard yeah. <laughs> you know, but over there by the wooden fence. Never growing tomatoes over there and absolutely had tomato hornworms. So I've not looked up tomato hornworms to see kind of their evolution, you know, Um but it's one of those moments of, oh, I'm growing in this new space. Well, maybe I won't have to worry about, you know, this pest returning no it it found them yeah Um, so i definitely think i've said this before while i've um been stubborn about crop rotation your brassicas are absolutely vegetables that i just what is it club root that i want to uh, avoid i just it's one of those things that stays in your soil for years and years and years and so because of my fear of that i absolutely rotate crops so that's a long answer to say i'm kind of a uh, wishy-washy about crop rotation yeah. <laughs> um, but i 125 percent agree with if you have powdery mildew you know any kind of fungus that's present on your leaves unless you have an abundance of fruit on those plants right now take it out right now yeah pause 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 the the podcast take it out yeah i mean well let, let's talk about tomato gate 2022 and just move it forward to 23 did you plant tomatoes back in that cage in the cage baby so i uh this is twice i've rolled my eyes yeah and, already uh, <laughs> and young ben has learned where you know he shouldn't call out the rolling of my eyes because it's not appropriate in my opinion. <laughs> so the, but I recognize that I mentioned Tomato Gate 2022, but what he hasn't learned is I can only mention it. He can't. Um, no, I did not. And there was not a tomato to be found. Well, I didn't plant tomatoes in the soil in the cage, baby. By the time I got to two of my container plants for tomatoes ripening, I took those containers and put them on like a milk crate. Right. Basically Elevated inside from the soil. Of, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. I, I was obedient while we never figured out exactly even what the disease was last year. Um, it still was worth my while to not even take a chance. And what I planted there thrived. It's the greens cabinet now. So, um, so yeah. Well, I want to go on the record saying I'm proud of you for doing that because I know last year you were not feeling that doing, you know, you were going to plant there initially. You wanted no, to. No, no. 
when we had talked, I remember you being like, I just want to plant there and I'm going to take my chance. And I w- I'm- No, you're, you're remembering it wrong. Am I? So, Am I? Yeah. So in 2021, <laughs> I um, saw like if I had 10 plants in there across the entire cage, I saw some trouble with one or two of them. And I said to myself then in 2021, I need to move my tomato plants out of this space. Right. 2022 came right. and I completely forgot about it. Yeah, right? you know, you're right. Like, it was I don't 21. know if I forgot about it. Or I, I don't know if I just was being, this is probably what you remember. I don't know if I, in that moment, was like, ah, oh, it'll be fine. Right? I think that's what it was, yeah, in 21. Yeah. But and I mean, so it, and it wasn't. Yeah, and how long do you, are you going to plant tomatoes in it next year? Or you no. think you'll give it another year? No, it's it'll be, um, I'll wait until the third year, minimally. Um, so good for you. That's that's hard because that was built for tomatoes. Absolutely, and it's not like I have just unlimited space either. Right. Um, so so yeah, I'm, I'll skip. So I planted them in 2022. Nothing in 2023, tomato wise. Nothing in 2024. I may return in 2025. Um, so so yeah, I mean, but that's that's one of those things. Like my stubbornness made for a really 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 shaky year last year when it came to the the production. Yeah. But I mean, I think now on 21, was it the same disease that you saw on 22? Do you remember? It was it was harder to tell because it was like one or two plants versus like all of them. Right. But it looked about the same. I, I think I had a sick aroma because, you know, sometimes they get sick. Yeah. Um. So. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and the only reason I know you don't like to talk about it, but it is what it is. It's a good example because. And I didn't even realize this. In 21, you saw it, but in 22, it took over. And mm-hmm. so in 23, you backed off. So, I mean, that sh- that proves the point almost in that small section mm-hmm. that no. crop rotation is a good thing to practice. I think, let me, I, 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 I want to be clear, and most people may not track with this. The cage maybe in the current version was built in 2020. So I had tomatoes in there in 2020 tomatoes completely in the cage maybe in 21 and then again all throughout the cage baby in 22 right prior to the cage baby's current version being built i grew tomatoes not you know from one end to another but there are tomato plants growing there for years and years yeah. right so i don't believe that you plant tomatoes in a place and you have some type of issue and you don't rotate your crops or let me say this way. I don't think you plant tomatoes there in year one. And then when you plant in year two, you're automatically going to have issues. I don't think it's that yeah. clean cut. But I have been pressing my luck. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. In completely. hindsight. Yeah. I agree with that because and I think it's just part of, you know, the um, the mitigation of disease spread and stuff like that, where mm-hmm. it's. You know, there's always a padding on what we're told, mm-hmm. you know, a safety mm-hmm. net. And so that's why it's like rotate every year. I mean, I'm not going to lie. If I get my garden planted and I'm like, this is the only space I have and I have didn't plant something like I'm going to put it back in the same place. Mm-hmm. But I think year over year over year over year, these things compound. And I agree with exactly with what you said that it may take three, four five years. But eventually, mm-hmm. I think yep. that it will catch up and rotating consistently and i've seen stuff um written where it's like rotate every other year Mm -hmm. i've seen things that say rotate and don't plant back in the same area for three years even if you had no issues or or i've seen two and three years which it gets extremely complicated at that point so i mean i don't i don't really know what the technical answer is and i think using your cage baby as you know, that space as a, as a litmus test for it mm-hmm. is a good thing because, I mean, you plan it, like you said, for years and years. But when the disease came, mm-hmm. it came and it came hard. Yeah. And one could argue, though, one could argue that while I had been planting years and years, I was planting other things prior to 20, 2020. 2020 was a glorious tomato year. Right. Mm -hmm. Every bit of that soil was focused on growing tomatoes. So one could call that year one, maybe. And then year two, it was, you know, 
rumblings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it depends. I think everything that I've seen about crop rotation is it's an annual thing. You're rotating every year. I've been very tempted just out of convenience because I set up these certain systems to say I'm growing tomatoes in this place for two years and then I'll move everything. I'm growing brassicas in this space for two years and I'm moving everything. You know, but I've just, there's so much, you know, uh, I'm depending on the garden for so much. I'm putting in so much time and I'm just dragging myself to the table to say, all right, fine, figure out a way to grow them in a different area. You know? Yeah. It's not, it's not rocket science. You know, sometimes I I tend to make it more difficult than what it is, especially when I've basically kind of cracked the code of, or the comfort code of growing and using cover in various places in my garden. Right. You know, so all that said, You don't think that you're the only one that does that, right? Use cover? No, makes it more complicated. Oh, no, no, of course not. Okay, yeah, I think a lot of us do that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's a requirement. Yeah, so it's interesting. I just um, looked up Late Blight real quick, and uh, Mm -hmm. it affects, I don't know if she's got on tomatoes or potatoes, but apparently Late Blight caused the uh, potato famine in Ireland in 1840s, the big potato famine that, have you ever heard of that? Yes. Yeah, it's like and, and specifically in Ireland. Yeah. yeah, and it killed over a million people and caused another million to leave the country. Mm-hmm. But a quick Google search, very quick, not looking into it, says that. And I don't want to say this out loud because I don't want to give you a reason to replant in the same area. <laughs> but apparently, it does not survive in the soil, the mm-hmm. organism mm-hmm. that causes it. Mm-hmm. That being said. Better safe than sorry, right? Yeah. And yeah, rotating is, I think, key. A lot of, uh, it's common to, for people to get blight, but it's also common for people to, she's not, for what you read, I don't think she said one way or another, but it's also common for people to mistake um, what's happening with their tomatoes for blight. So there's that. Yeah. Yeah, there is. But I mean, look, it's, diseases are like, the scariest thing when it comes to gardens because they're so hard to see. There's no telling. And I mean, honestly, as soon as you see a disease, you pull up the plant, get it out of there. And I mean, I did that this year. I didn't pull up my plant. I left my uh, green beans in there to see what would happen. And they just, they kept dying over and over. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a single green bean this year because of that. If Mm -hmm. I would have moved them, I would have been good, but I did not do that. So you got to keep that in mind. Um, And I won't plant green beans there for years now. I probably anything. I think it was the um, mosaic is either mosaic virus. Yeah, mosaic virus is what I think it got. So I've got to look up and see how long that lasts for. But I won't be planting anything that is susceptible to that in that area mm-hmm. for years. And I mean, that's just how it goes. You know what I mean? And that's why I think and we're kind of getting off course a little bit. We'll get back on it. I think a bigger garden is almost easier when it comes to this stuff because you have more options to rotate stuff in and out. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're adding two more beds this year, which I didn't want to do, but it just makes it easier to rotate things in and out. Yeah, I'm tempted to take my current layout and kind of, you know, create a full year one, you know, because a part of the, the challenge, which is a true challenge by the time I got on the crop rotation, and even at the beginning of this episode, you can still see I'm like, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm battling back and forth. But by the time I got uh, on the crop rotation um, bandwagon, I have been growing some of these vegetables in the same space over and over and over again. You know, so it's kind of like there's a part of me that's like, all right, clean slate year one, because there are a bunch of different tools and, you know, cool you know, um, graphics out there, you know, a bunch of things on various extension services that say, OK, this is the recommendation. Right. And they mm-hmm. give you the one, two, three year planting plan. Now, I've never come across anything that's going to list every vegetable that you want to grow, because generally they're grouped in plant families, but you can make it work. Yeah. Um, so. But yeah, I mean, I think that. um it's probably the most responsible thing to do, but that's not it to is. say we always do it. Well, and I think with that being said, it's a very good time to tell everybody about the planter app because in real talk, everybody, I will look at the planter app and this year's plan next year 
over the winter and I will see where things are planted and I will use that to help me refer when to rotate all of my crops. So it's a great tool to use for that along with all the different varieties and, you know, different plants it has in there, but you can get it. And like I said before, you can use it on your phone, your computer, your app, you know, your tablet, anywhere. And it's a really invaluable tool for this because not only is it going to go through and tell you about the companion planting, well, it tells you about the companion planting part, but it also you can refer back years. So like Batavia could go back and see where she had planted stuff five years ago if she'd been using it that long and it's all recorded for you to use. So definitely check that out. It's um, when we come into this time of year, it's an invaluable tool because I forget like I've got three different iterations of my garden every year. So I cannot (laughs) remember where things are. And the good news is there's a link below that will get you a discount on it. So definitely check that out. So you can use the planner app to help you design and keep track and rotate your gardens. Because I think crop rotation is going to be a big thing for all of this. But, you know, she said she's got powdery mildew too. That's a tough one. That's a really, really hard one. Um, we know what causes powdery mildew, right? Moisture. Um, humidity. Le- yeah, humidity, moisture on leaves and stuff like that. So it's like... you, If you're overhead watering and you live in a humid place and you're watering in the evenings or something, you're going to have powdery mildew. And... Gen generally speaking, you're going to have powdery mildew no matter what, right? It depending on where you live. Um, I switched to an ir- in-ground irrigate drip system this year, and believe it or not, I had very, very minimal powdery mildew, and it is humid here, mm-hmm. so that really helped out with me. But you've got to rotate your squashes, and I think you have to rotate those. You know, anything susceptible to that every single year, mm-hmm. no matter what. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's so weird. I mean, I'm going to count these all as blessings. I got the very beginnings of what looked like, based on my internet search, downy mildew. Yeah. Which, as far as I'm aware, I've not had in my garden before. And that was in the end of July. And the recommendation is to pull the plant. I had so few cucumber plants, I just basically uh, pruned and fast forward to the beginning of September, I saw the signs of what looked like traditional powdery mildew. So that was over in the very first bed in the front yard garden. Um, and right now, I mean, I'm a month later. And I mean, as I mentioned this on a video recently, as my, my mom would say, you know, those plants look in po. You yeah. Know, like, you know, so there's that. And then I had one zucchini plant that had some powdery mildew. I'm going to say around the same time, like for some leaves, I just pruned that, pruned that. And now it looks fine. It hasn't produced a whole lot. So we're not going to get into that. We're not, we're not going to get into my love hate relationship with squash. No, um, we definitely but I say all I don't want to rant. I, yeah. I'll say all that to say like, it's, neither of those are, I would recommend. I'm not, this is one of those don't you do as I say, not as I do. Um, but I have se- I've had some like terrible years with powdery mildew and early in the season. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out if there's a line through like, did I plant in those spaces prior to that year? But that kind of goes back to the planter wrap. Like all of that stuff is, I mean, you're talking about trying to go back to 2017, 18, 19 when it was really bad and trying to figure it out. Um, which ties back into the planter app and really having some good records. So it's f- funny. I was, um, I'm currently trying to figure out how to do a, a live on YouTube with the planter app. Cause you know, the goal is for both of us to do it at some point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm, I pulled it up on my computer and I have the, um, I have the different iterations of my garden for the past three years on there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, and you know, as far as the, squash and powdery mildew and all that goes you know this is the first year i've used the drip irrigation and i know that i've talked bad about it before but i built like my own drip irrigation and um 
Like I said, I didn't have powdery mildew. Now I can tell you in the past, I had so much powdery mildew when the wind blowed, it looked like it was snowing. It was terrible. <laughs> I mean, it was just spores going everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I had read, you know, like you said, you can trim it out. And honestly, trimming it out is a good thing for multiple things. One, you're removing the, you know, the spores from it because it's, it's a fungus. It's not a disease. And you're, you're removing the spores, but what you're also doing is you're creating airflow around that plant mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, at the same time. And that's really the key to fighting these things is keeping them pruned. Keep it. And I mean, squash, you can prune pretty heavy because I'm going to give everybody a little hint. Generally speaking, squash put is almost like a determinant tomato. It'll put on yeah. heavy and then it'll stop producing as much. So there comes a point where you could just pull it out of your garden completely. So, I mean, you know, that's always an option, too. Once you start getting it, once what I usually do, and I didn't do it this year because I failed at it. Um, shout out to the episode coming up at the end of the year that I always dread. Um, <laughs> once my squash start producing, I start planting the next round. Mm-hmm. And that way, you know, when the other ones are producing, I'll pull those out and just start doing or I'll start the seeds and, you know, something like that. But there's always options to do that. But I mean, as far as like winterizing for that, you just, you got to get those plants out of there. And I think the key to stopping it is honestly taking action before you have, you know, before the winter comes. And as soon as you see these diseases, you pull them out because there is no treatment for it. I've done stuff like, um, I sprayed milk in the summertime on it. There's like a milk mixture. And when this supposedly the proteins of whole cow's milk, will hit the leaves and the sun will activate it and it'll kill the spores and it just smelled like rotten milk. That's all it was, you know, and I was just keeping my leaves wet all the time, making it worse. So, I mean, that's really the best thing you can do. One thing you can do too is, um, and always recommend this, especially if you're having issues is getting a soil test because a lot of like blossom end rot, for example, isn't necessarily because of, um, you know, a disease or anything. Sometimes it can be because there's a calcium deficiency in your garden. And it, what the calcium does is it doesn't allow, if you have, if the number is off, then it cannot allow the plant to uptake the water like it's supposed to. And that will cause like blossom end rot and stuff. So anytime you have some kind of issue, winter is the best time to get a good soil test done. And don't check pH with a home test kit because they are way wrong. <laughs> You there? All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm just looking to see. Did we? Do we feel I, like we answered our question? No. So when do you pull plants out overall? Um, Let's get back to that. Something that's diseased, right? Yeah. So you've covered that. I think we beat that that horse there. Um, I'm pulling plants out before the soil freezes, which again, I'm assuming she experiences that. I know everyone doesn't, of course. Yeah. Um, so the month of October, if I'm, um, let me be realistic. November is probably when I'm coming in and doing like a clean sweep. Yeah. So I just started pulling plants out that aren't producing, but anything like after the frost, once it's dead, I just go ahead and I might give it a, a week or two, but I'll go back fairly quickly and pull all those plants out as well. That's, I, I'd like to revise my, my answer. To okay. the court. Uh, so summer plants is what I start with, yeah. and that's November. There's still some things that are frost hardy in my garden in November that absolutely has, you know, uh, delicious vegetables on them, mostly leafy greens at that point. So I'd leave those. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that um, a part of outside of, you know, insects and birds and things. And if you're not in a, an environment where it doesn't sound like she is, where those roots will actually break down, unless you have that experience where if you leave something in the ground over winter, you come back in and basically it's composted underneath, get it, get it out of your garden. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, you know, reminder of the garden season that's gone, whether it was good or bad or somewhere in between. Um, it's, you know, one less thing for you to do in the the next year, right? So if you have the time in this season, do it. If you don't have the time, try to make the time. Um, I can't think of a positive outside of what we've just mentioned 
for leaving them in the ground. Yeah, I mean, other than the pollinators and insects to have, I, I mean, because the thing is, is even you can still be spreading disease. So I agree with you. Get it out of there. And even if you, let's say you're growing um, broccoli and you harvest a head of broccoli, if you want to grow side shoots, fine. But if you're not growing side shoots, go ahead and clip that plant and get it out of there too. Because it's just going to cause problems. You know, it's not going to do you any good to leave it there. And I mean, the more space you have. And the thing is, is, you know, the summertime's easy because everything's going to grow and it's lush and your garden's basically always going to be filled to an extent. But in the mm-hmm. winter time, there comes a point where it gets real gappy and mm-hmm. thing, you know, late fall, you know, and for me, winter. And you want to put stuff in, but you can't. And it, it's OK. You know, you're finishing out your garden. Let it, yeah. let it go. Yeah, the step where, you know, when I think overwintering or winterizing, I think is the other part of the question. Um, it's easier to do when you have fewer plants there. Now, I want to be crystal clear here. Do it. This is, in addition to do as I say um, kindly, I really try to do this, but I don't get this kind of thing done every year. Right. You know, and this also ties into giving yourself a bit of grace. Um, There have been years that I've been surprised the next spring with a super early harvest of kale or collards because I left those plants in. Yeah. Those are probably some pretty um, bad plants to leave in, too, though. Yeah. (laughs) When you think about some of the, you know, whether it's aphids, whether it's, you know, the cabbage worm, like leaving all of that in the soil probably isn't the best idea. Um if you have a container, I, you know, I'd say give it a try. Let's see. Because it's nothing like, you know, in the earliest part of, of spring, having like actual leaves on plants that are edible. Um, so, again, I don't want don't go back there and look at a 2019 Be Better Garden video and say, wait a minute. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, that's there. the thing about all this is over the years you grow and learn and you do different things. And I mean, cleaning out the garden is it's. It's it's like this. There's one. There's two ways to look at it. It's a sad time, and then the way I look at it is, I'm getting ready for spring already, mm-hmm. because you know how it is when spring comes. It's like you got to plant everything. You got to do all this stuff. You're probably gonna mm-hmm. build some something else to grow in more than likely, even if it's just a pot. You're going plant shopping. You're just you're all in, and eliminating these tasks that really should be done in fall just sets you up to have more time to focus on where to plant stuff. Cause I mean, once you get everything out, then you can put your garden to bed Mm -hmm. for the winter. And there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can just walk away from it and say, I'm done. I mean, that's always an option. I like to take more steps than that. And one of the reasons is, um, I don't know if you know anything about, or you probably do, but you know, if a listener out there doesn't know about like sports injuries or anything, there's a thing called active recovery. And I like to think Mm -hmm. about it as active recovery where the whole garden season has just been constant, bam, bam, bam. And as it's winding down, this is like my time to like actively recover from that busy time. I can take my time. There is no rush to do it. You know, I can pull these plants out I can go through and do my beds and do whatever I need to do to get them done. And then once they're done, you got a blank slate to plan out on. And it's a lot easier to look at a blank slate than something and just look at it constantly. I got to go out there and pull those plants. Man, I wish I would have pulled those plants. I just got Mm -hmm. this task to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because a lot of my plants are producing until the very end. Yeah. You know, so we were talking about this recently. It's hard to get ahead of things. And sometimes you have to uh, take it one plant at a time. Right. Um, So, I mean, I think that a couple of days ago, I was, I still had some summer vegetables. I still do have some summer vegetables to harvest. Um, And I wanted to come out and pick some tomatoes right and some peppers and some things and it was going to rain the next day and I started that morning and I ended up 
not getting everything done. And so I said, I'll come back in the afternoon. Work got busy. It was like 5.30, 5.45. Nowadays, you know, 6.30, I'm looking, you know, for raccoons and trying to get it in the house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, so I, I realized I only had an hour. And so I hustled to get the things that I thought the rain would ha- cause a problem for the next day or that would really delay, you know, um, my picking like the few string beans I have left the tomatoes and all. And sure enough, I was up at like 1230, like, you know, around midnight. What do I hear? Rain. You know, so if, if she's asking about this now, right, like her instincts are telling her that she should be pulling this stuff out. And it's like, listen to your, as my mom would say, listen to your first mind. Right. Um, It's going to guide you in the right way in most cases. So, right. Yeah, because I mean, put once it you, off if you can do it now. Yeah, exactly. And once you pull everything out of your bed, then it's time to, you know, winterize them. Mm-hmm. And d- I don't know if we do the same thing. This should be interesting. What do you do to winterize your beds? Um. So the easiest method for me, and this is, as I like to say, the best version of my garden self. Uh, the pl- the beds are empty. Um, there are a couple of beds that I have that have some really rocky soil, you know, and so I try to break that up a little bit. Um, I'll add compost. I still use bad compost to those garden beds and then I'll cover them, which is probably the most important if you do nothing else. Probably the most important thing to do is cover them with some type of mulch. And yeah. right now my um, my mulch of choice is shredded leaves. Um, unless I'm planting garlic, I've continued to use straw for that. Let's, I don't exactly know why, but, um, yeah, I don't know why either. That's weird. I don't think it yeah. really matters. Well, it does. It's one, of those, it's one of those weird things where, um, because I've had success and only success with, um, straw, it's like, I don't want to try something different. Sometimes leaves, even with them being shredded, kind of have this kind of matting effect mm-hmm. um so that's a part of and they just they retain it seems like more water but it, i don't want to get off track so that's my approach pull plants if i need to work up soil just a little bit right because i'm preparing myself to come in like hitting the ground running next year so i may work up the soil just a little bit add some compost and then cover the beds with uh leaves if i have time to do nothing else but cover the beds with leaves that's still winning you know, and you could basically add compost per planting hole when you plant next year or move the leaves away or whatever you're using for mulch in the spring away. So that's my approach. Again, in the best version of, of my garden, self ending the year. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not totally different from you. So I do know as far as mulch goes, leaves has more nutrients in it than straw mm-hmm. once it breaks down. So I do know that. But I do about the same thing. I'll. I may, it depends on the bed. Let's just say I had a normal bed, um, no issues really. I would just kind of scratch the surface up pretty good. I would actually give it some fertilizer, some organic fertilizer just to kind of feed everything in the garden for the winter. And then I'll put, um, I have access to chicken manure, so I'll put hot chicken manure on there, which just means fresh if I can do it early enough, but if it's later in the season, I won't do it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll put, I may put, if I have leftover compost, I'll put that in. And then I definitely go ahead and cover it with mulch, just like you do. And it's interesting. If you guys cover it with mulch, why don't you do us a favor and measure how much Mm -hmm. mulch you have when you put it down. And then in the spring, when you come back, look and see how much is left. I think you're going to be surprised how much is actually left in your garden. And then at that point, when it's time to wake the garden up, I just turn the soil over and get that mulch work back into it. And then, you know, kind of do my normal routine as far as planting goes. But that way, over the winter, that mulch will break down. Even if you freeze all the way, it's going to go through a freeze and thaw process to an extent. And it's going to, you know, it's usually the rainy season. So you're Mm -hmm. going to get moisture in there and it's going to break down. It's going to give places things to live, feed the microbes and organisms and all that stuff in there and really keep it strong and healthy. 
So, I mean, I think it's a really important thing. I mean, like we said before, you could just walk away from it too and do it in the spring, but I think you're missing out on a really good opportunity to let the garden work for you while you rest. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we try to employ a lot around our, our homestead and our garden is, you know, it's like right now I've got my chickens out there weeding for me and they're going to be doing it for the next month or two. And we're just constant keeping them on there. And that's just less that we have to do, but it's benefiting in multiple ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But putting that um, fertilizer down at the same time has really worked for me. But I plant much more intensively than you do. So it's a big difference. And I would not go back and add it again in the winter. But that first time I put it right down. And actually this year I've been adding um, alfalfa pellets, like horse feed alfalfa pellets. I've been putting that on my garden too to add mm -hmm. nitrogen and it seems to be doing pretty good okay yeah you definitely plant more intensely I, I won't say like it's your bed planting style is probably the same as mine as mine or i may yeah. even plant more intensely but just a number of year um of months throughout the year yeah, that's that what you're I mean. growing in those beds absolutely um and i think that that's again i'm, I'm gonna i mean i feel like I feel like I have a garden neighbor, right? You know, so yeah. uh, between 6A and 6B, um, maybe, you know, March at an early, early point, you know, through November-ish is probably where your garden is, um, or maybe a shorter period of time, which is cool too. And, you know, I think that, because I want to get to this next bit around, you know, how do you give yourself grace? Because again spirit animal um take advantage of that downtime right yeah and i mean like it's like we said while you're taking that downtime the garden's going to be working for you and doing things and building itself up and i think setting it up once you're done for the winter and your bed's empty that's when you do all these things because you want to add one last thing about it is Putting nitrogen back into the soil over winter will let you hit the ground running when you put fresh plants in. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the compost is nitrogen. The alfalfa sprouts or, or pellets are nitrogen. The chicken manure is nitrogen. You know, all that stuff. So either way, it works out good. But to get to the topic of grace, I don't really know how to answer that. Do you? So... Are you, is this, is this the weird moment where like your people are going to come out with like a birthday cake? Like, yeah, like there's going to be, my birthday isn't until December 1st. Like there's like, this is the setup though of like, of yeah, course like you the way know. you said that, like you expect everybody to be sending you presents and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, so no, I don't expect that. Uh, uh, so um, I, I, every year go through this. This has been such a good year with forgiving myself about what I haven't. And now this is going to get a little personal because this may not be everyone's experience. So I really do hope that it can apply and be helpful. I have still have uh, vegetables in the garden. And instead of it's, it's I know it's going to seem like simple Simon. Instead of me focusing on what I didn't get planted, what I didn't grow, what didn't grow well, um, I really am looking at some things that I have not even been able to keep up with harvest wise. Right. You know, so there is an abundance somewhere in the garden. You just have to turn that into the thing that, you know, was beneficial to you. Um, so I cracked the code quantity wise for planting string beans, pole beans last year. And this year I really, 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 really struggled with getting uh, beans off you know, and running based on them being eaten up by um, roly poly slash pill bugs. Um, and so this year that was a struggle. And then my, the way I wanted to grow them vertically was a struggle for me. But I come out of this garden year like I have other green things to eat. Yeah. Right. Not as many, not as many green beans um, as I would have liked. But I absolutely have a plan going into next year. So the harvest was slower, lower, you know, less. Um, you know, one could argue it's not your experience. Like I did get some green beans, 
but I feel empowered when it comes to that particular vegetable coming into next year. Cause not only last year, I figure out the quantity. Now I know a couple of the planting methods that just don't work well for me. Yeah. Right. I'm going to take those things and then come out with a powerhouse. Everyone look at your mailbox next, uh, next summer because you have a package of green beans for me. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> no but I mean it's 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 you know there's similar points in life I was thinking about this this morning meaning you know some of the ways that we give ourselves grace in our everyday lives you can apply to the garden I was in the kitchen this morning and I was for very preserving some things and I thought and I want to be sensitive here um the gift the blessing is being able to grow my own food a lot of it, not all of it in this moment, like right where we are in time. And then there's the second blessing of not needing to. And I want to be explicit about in this moment because things change. Right. You know, what do they say? Everyone's one health crisis away from bankruptcy, you know. Um, so I feel just blessed that I was able to learn more, kind of hone my skill as a gardener. This is all about giving grace. Right. You know, so did everything go according to plan? Absolutely not. Right. Did I have other obligations that didn't allow me to spend as much time in the garden as I wanted to and to tend to things in the way I, I wanted to? Absolutely. You know, but that's OK. Well, you know, I was just thinking about it when you were talking on your um, epilogue there, which was very nice. Thank you. I mm. feel uplifted. Mm. And um, it's, the question reads, how do you. <laughs> <laughs> the question, I'm over here shaking my head like, mm-hmm, shoot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> give myself my own self an amen. <laughs> but I'm reading the question that says, how do you give yourself grace? And the way I interpret it, because, you know, it can be different, is how do I deal with my failures in the garden? Which kind of it comes across with me. That's how I look at it is, you know, my green beans failed this year. But you know what? Other than not having green beans, and, you know, I was upset about that because we do kind of depend on it a lot. I, I really, like you said, I focused on all the other things that I was doing and learning the other things and testing out different techniques. And I wasn't even really concerned about the. I mean, clearly I wasn't. I didn't even replant them. I just watched them wither the way and I was like, whatever, it's good. And I think it's that thing where if you're gardening and you're serious about it, which most people listening to this show are probably serious about it, I would assume you're, you're always going to be trying something different. You're always going to, and you're, you can expect failure, but -hmm. you have to realize that it's not the end of the world. I mean, the only way that you're never going to grow another, like I'll never get to grow another green beans if I die over the winter, you know, that's the only way because I can replant green beans next year, you know? And I think that's kind of how I've dealt with it over the years. You know, I'm on my, I think this is officially my fourth year of failing at Brussels sprouts. And hopefully I'll get them this year, but it's just, I keep trying different methods and I get closer and closer every year. And you want to see, I want, I want to see that progress. You know what I mean? And that's what gives mm-hmm. me comfort in it mm-hmm. because I, I know I'm not going to give up. I know this is something I really want. And aside from moving to a different place, like I got to deal with what I have and also learning how to flex a little bit and change what I grow to fit my climate better has helped me as well. Like for instance, last two years ago, I started growing black eyed peas, total game changer. They love my climate this year. Instead of butternut squash, I grew seminal pumpkins. Couldn't be happier with the way it's growing. It's putting on a foot a day still as we speak. And we've got pumpkins coming up, you know, so we're, we constantly are doing these things. And um, I just I, I put my head down and I move forward, you know, I mean, you're talking to a guy four years ago I had or five years ago, I had a tree eight feet in diameter laying across my entire garden, had to rebuild the whole thing and do it over again. And you just you deal with that. You know what I mean? And it's you can't beat yourself up. The only way that I beat myself up is if I have a total failure and I did not do anything to correct it. That's when I cannot give myself grace because that's my own fault. And um, uh, so one other note here, and I'll wrap up my um, sermon on it. (laughs) Don't wrap it up. I like it. There's some people that had near total 
loss. And yeah. if they did, most times it was weather related. Absolutely yeah. too hot, absolutely too wet. And you just have to believe that there's not much you were able to do about that. There's not much you're able to control uh, with that. Um, and so with that in mind, for those that didn't have that experience, but still struggled, I just did a recent video on, you know, 10 successes and fails. So I'm very comfortable with looking at what didn't go well in the garden. And it's interesting because people, it almost feels like people's natural reaction is to say, well, it's not about what fails. I mean, I keep it really real, son. This is what I do in all parts of my life. I have to figure out in many cases as close to the root of the problem as I can, no pun intended, before I feel like I can come up with a plan to not revisit that, you know, to improve and so on. Um, but for people that, again, didn't have your total, you know, tsunami of rain this season or, you know, the hottest temps we've ever seen before. Like if you didn't have that experience and you did get things out of your garden, let's not look at the entire garden as did it succeed or fail. Again, look for those pockets. Yeah. Right. You know, this is probably the fourth year that I have not gotten the flowers that I've wanted started the fourth year right and i love flowers like i get weepy just thinking about how happy they make me now what i ended up doing was buying a bunch of uh you know flowers from stores in this year unfortunately about 60 percent of them were planted the other 40 percent are still die dying on the side of my house um, but all that said it's there's some pieces i can look out now and see my hibiscus that set on another few blooms like fine pockets of grace I think um, well, like, fine pockets of success. I, I got to say something and you're going to roll your eyes. So I'm not even going to call you out when you do. And you'll probably call me ch cheesy. But um, there's a great philosopher, great philosopher. And I truly believe that if there's anything I've ever said on any platform ever, this is the one thing that I truly live by and believe wholeheartedly other than, you know, God and stuff like that. But my failures are how I learn the most. I learn 10 times more off of every failure than I ever would if I succeed, because that drives me to try again and to figure out what happened. And when I figure it out or if I get close or I've read something about it, then I start to get something else figured out why some of something else did. And I think that's why I've been successful as a gardener over these years, because I look at the failures as an opportunity to learn. And I mean, look at Bob Ross, the, the famous philosopher. It's a happy little accident. Anytime that man messed up a painting, it turned out 10,000 times better. Did it not? He had a giant tree that didn't, wasn't supposed to be. There. I, was, I mean, it's just amazing to watch, but you know, I draw and I paint and stuff like that. Every time I mess up, I'm forced to fix it and it always turns out better. So that's kind of, for me, that's my built-in grace too. You didn't roll yeah, your eyes. I'm, not, I'm surprised. Uh, yeah. I'm a little <laughs> bit offended that you announced that I would be and you were like really, really wrong. No, in all seriousness, I mean, I don't, if I could go with a, you know, fail proof garden go ahead keep on failing if you want to you know i take it but that's yeah. not life right you know and so uh, there's some things that there's a question in the combo listener questions episode and i i think we addressed it during the episode but are there things that you're just like the heck with it i'm not gonna try again you know as if as far as the garden and most things i am just like i'm doubling down i'm tripling down if you ever see my garden over two years and you see a vegetable planted and then you see like three times the amount planted the next year it's probably because i stumbled a lot that previous year and i am increasing my odds because i am now like completely locked in to succeeding in that so yeah i agree with you and uh bob bob my man bob <laughs> so there's grace now <clears throat> that being said we do have a question that i got uh, that we got on the um looks like helen gave us Wait, this question before we get yeah. to helen just one more comment also recognize in a couple of months 
we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna be gleefully you know past this growing season and focus on the next one where all things are possible so just all you had to do is hold out until then you don't even have yeah. to hold out until you're actually planting hold out until you're planning next year's garden and it's it's like magic like i forget all of the woes of the previous year yeah <laughs> that's why it's important to note them now right well and i mean this is the time of year that we reflect and mm-hmm. i mean you can read one comment, you go to a restaurant, you get one bad review outweighs a hundred great reviews, you know, mm-hmm. and it's the same thing. But um, Helen actually gave us a couple questions. So this episode, we're going to go through this one, which is good. She labeled it question, but I think she meant Spotify questions. So we're going <laughs> to go for it, Helen. Um, and this is a good one. Has anyone used styrofoam boxes for planters? She gets stuff shipped to her work. That's styrofoam from two to eight gallon plant, two to eight gallon size, and the walls are at least an inch thick. They get they just get thrown in the trash. And her boss said that she was welcome to take what she wants, but wants to know if it could poison the plants and how thick they were to help them maintain soil temperature and hydration. Any thoughts? She's in zone six A seven B. What do you think? You didn't um, chime in on this one, so I don't know if you saw it. This sounds familiar. Yeah, you probably saw it, but you may not have said anything. It's okay. Yeah, it's a, well, thanks. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, I my vote would be um, not t- to not use them. Yeah. So my vote would be no. I just I think about sometimes. Have you ever had like the little balls of the styrofoam? They're like on your pants leg or something or on your sleeve. And I kind of think about that as it because it's going to break down. You're going to put, um, you know, a shovel in it or a spade in it. You're going to nick the styrofoam. Um, And I think ultimately, I personally just don't want that floating around into my soil. Um, So I'm going to vote no on using it to grow food. Because you're also going to drill holes in it for drainage, right? You know, so you're creating in that moment that opportunity for that thing to break down. And again, those little bitty pieces of um, fibers and such to float around in your soil. Yeah, it's 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 a difficult one because, well, first of all, I think it would definitely insulate because they're basically coolers, right? Mm-hmm. People have been using star from coolers for years. Um So it would definitely insulate warmth and heat, keep it out, whatever. It would retain water. But I do know, and I answered this briefly on here. um, I know like if you get to-go containers that are styrofoam and you put them in the microwave, when they get hot, they do release chemicals back into the food. I don't know what that means as far as your plants being in there, but that kind of raises some suspicions. But the other thing too, and somebody was actually they mentioned it and she even mentioned it herself. It's just, you know, when the sun hits it, it's going to break it down. It's going to make it fragile. And that causes concern for me. So I don't know if I would use it. It would be interesting. Now the horse in the room is who says you can't use it and just line the inside of it with some, like an old soil bag or something to protect it. I mean, I don't know the answer to this one. This is like, um, you definitely need to make the judgment call yourself, but I don't think every container is good to use for a container garden. And it's just like, I don't buy plastic pots anymore to put plants in because they last a year or two and the sun degrades them and they're fragile and they never break down. They just turn into microplastics. I am. Um, I spot on every container isn't everything isn't recycled for the garden. Um, Maybe you could use it to hold some of your garden tools. There's that. Uh, So I am sick with everything goes through my register of can I use it? Can I repurpose it? Everything that I see, everything I come across during a day. So I definitely see it, especially when it's it's such a great volume. You know, so she's like, you know, they they always get them at work. It's kind of like, gosh, you know. You think about where this thing is going and if you could bring it home to reuse it, you know, gosh, you know, pretty cool styrofoam cooler garden. Um, you know, if this was the end of, end of the the days of, you know, kind of post-apocalypse, you better believe I'd be growing in <laughs> styrofoam. Uh, but if I have access to other options, which I personally do, I'd use those before I use styrofoam. 
Yeah, and I interesting mean, interesting question though because we do we do try to get really creative as gardeners. That's you why know, I love it. And yeah, and, and try to seize opportunities like this. And I now mean, I'm going to be stuck with trying to figure out Helen if not putting soil and planting in it, what could you use it for? Well, and that's the thing too is I mean, first of all, maybe the company should try and figure something different out, but that's neither here nor there. Um it's a tough one because it's an incredible waste and it's admirable. And that's one thing I like about gardeners and homesteaders alike is we look at these things and we think like, how can we use this and not waste it? Mm-hmm. You know, um, if it did, if you could use it, I mean, she'd probably have the biggest container garden on the planet. It sounds like, but I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that one. I know that it leaches into your food. If you put it in the microwave, now the microwave is a lot hotter, this, that, and the other, but I know that if you put stuff outside and it's 85 degrees outside, the surface of that thing is going to be well over 85 degrees, maybe 95, 100 degrees at some point. Even though it's white, it's still going to get warm and retain that heat, too. I would imagine once it gets into that soil, it'll probably retain it, which would make it good f- for winter, but not necessarily summer. I'm not in my head, yeah. Yeah, I know you are. So, Helen, that's the best we can do for you. That's a really good question, and it's a tough one. And as far as containers go, I like to reuse the uh, the nursery pots that people get rid of. That's what I use. Um, I try to mm-hmm. find the ones that trees come in. I've got six of them, seven of them now, and um, they're big enough to put whatever I want in them. So I, I do like to do that. And I've tried smaller ones, and they just don't work for me. Got to start over at the drawing board. So there you go. Thank you for your question. If you'd like to be like Helen, leave a question. You can leave it on any platform that we're on. And if you want it, just simplicity, just put Spotify question, even if you're not listening on Spotify, because that's just kind of how it works. Spotify has made it difficult. But um, (laughs) other than that, do you have anything else to say about winter garden prep? Mm -hmm. Just layer up. Yeah. Spring is a coming. Yeah. (laughs) And enjoy what you've grown. But until then, everybody, we're going to continue to learn to grow and grow for change. See ya. Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Thanks for checking out the show. If you like what we're doing and you'd like to support us, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash backyard gardens, or you can be an Apple subscriber. And in both of those, you'll get an extra episode every month. You can also make a one-time PayPal donation with the link below. And you can get all kinds of gardening gear, like t-shirts and mugs and cups from the link below at Teespring. And we have an Amazon store, which has all the products that we use and recommend in our gardens and it helps support our show and we also add to this list periodically so be sure to check it out periodically to see if there's anything that you need for your garden everything that you do including a like and a subscribe and even a review will help us learn to grow and grow for change see ya